midday morning in New York City. And this modest stairwell is the entrance to one of the most important buildings in railroad history, Pennsylvania Station. More than 500,000 people, the population of Wyoming, will go in and out of this entrance today. In spite of its volume of passengers, the Pennsylvania Station of today is little more than a glorified subway station. Low ceilings, dim lighting, and poor acoustics make it a place most people want to scurry through as quickly as possible. And few of these people have any idea of what a glorious monument to railroading was once here. Built between 1906 and 1910, Penn Station was a place of inspiring beauty and elegance, of soaring inspiration, as well as clockwork efficiency. It was perhaps the loftiest expression of corporate architecture ever erected in this country. Until it was tragically demolished in 1966, it was the grandest train station of them all. If I were passenger, coming into Manhattan, arriving in Penn Station in 1910, I would have felt like a king. It would have given me a sense of entitlement that would have surprised me. Because the station was so extraordinary, because there were so many elements of the station put together just to make me feel good about arriving in this city, I would have understood that I was very, very special. I want to give you a sense of what it was like to enter Pennsylvania Station when that wonderful building was in fact here. Now, you could have come out the exit concourse uh, and avoid the main concourse, but if you decided to treat yourself, what you would do is take this staircase up here and be in probably one of the most dramatic uh, rooms in the country. The ceiling of the train, what I call the train shed of Pennsylvania Station was a series of intersecting barrel vaulted arches. Imagine standing in this room, you've got the light pouring down, filtering down, the dust particles are caught in the air, coming down onto a glass floor. In fact, we have a little bit of the ghost of Pennsylvania Station still with us. I like to think of Penn Station as a stubborn ghost. In fact, it won't go away. And we have some of it right here. And these bl glass blocks actually used to light the exit concourse below. If we were in the old Penn Station, we would exit the concourse from some rather inauspicious doors. But when we walk through them, we would be in one of the most magnificent rooms in the entire country. Your eye left the floor, soared up the 60-foot Corinthian columns, soared up 150 feet high to a coffered vaulted ceiling. The room was made of a travertine marble, which is a warm honey-colored marble that in effect is enhanced by wear. All that's left of the main waiting room of Pennsylvania Station is right over here. If you look down here with me, beyond this terrazzo is some of the original pink Vermont marble. It was absolutely exquisite when it was here, and most people who come over here and make telephone calls don't realize that they're actually standing on history. The history of the Pennsylvania Station begins in the early years of this century. It was an exciting and dynamic time. The country was booming with growing strength and accomplishment. Teddy Roosevelt, the perfect embodiment of an energized America, sent the Great White Fleet to impress the world with the nation's awakening potency and influence. New York City was changing. The L now reached into new and different neighborhoods. The automobile would soon appear on city streets to challenge the horse and carriage. Skyscrapers rose everywhere as the city grew and moved continuously uptown. It had reached 42nd Street, where the New York Central Railroad had built its Grand Central Station. And no facet of American life better represented the robust strength and optimism of a country entering a new century than its railroads.
In 1900, Americans were traveling over a railroad system that ran over 37,000 locomotives on almost 200,000 miles of track. From the tiniest hamlet to the nation's great cities, no other industry dominated American life like the railroad. And of the over 1,200 separate railroads in America at the turn of the century, none was the equal of the Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania Railroad was the most powerful of all of these railroads. They hauled more passengers, more freight than any other railroad. They were the richest railroad. Uh, they had by far the greatest power. The Pensy, as it was known, was the unquestioned leader in technology and operating practices. Although other lines, such as the Union or Southern Pacific, had more track, no line served a more profitable route system. The Pennsylvania Railroad was really uniquely situated, being located where they were in the, in the heart of Pennsylvania, where the steel mills were established, where so much of the mining was done, so much of the heavy industry was built up. But the railroad needed a direct link to New York City if it was to grow and compete. In 1871, the Pennsylvania leased the United Canal and Railroad Companies of New Jersey. So that took them to the west bank of the Hudson where they could look across at New York and they built a big terminal there and they had ferry boats that took their passengers across to Manhattan. The ride across could be smooth and direct or a heaving, rolling ordeal that had some passengers seasick before they reached the other side. And when they docked in Manhattan, passengers were swept into a jostling, traffic-choked West Street, crowded with teams of horses, peddlers, panhandlers, and even prostitutes. Their arch rival, the New York Central and Hudson River Railroad, run by the Vanderbilts, came right into Manhattan, right to their Grand Central Depot on 42nd Street. And this was something that the Pennsylvania simply couldn't accept. For not only was it inconvenient for passengers whose destination was Manhattan, but the Pensy also lacked a direct connection to New England railroads, such as the New Haven. And there was prestige involved. They were the Pennsylvania, the greatest railroad in America. They couldn't let their rival continue to dominate the greatest destination in the nation. A solution had to be found, and in 1899, it was. His name was Alexander Cassatt. He was chosen as the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, he came from a wealthy Pittsburgh family, had studied engineer at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and as a young man had gone to work for the Pennsylvania as a civil engineer. Uh, rose rapidly through the ranks and, and in the 1880s became a vice president. And finally, in 1899, at a critical point in the history of the railroad, uh, he was elected president and immediately set out not only solving the Manhattan access problem, but in carrying out over a 10-year period the greatest program of improvements in the railroad's history. Cassatt was determined to find a way into New York and present his railroad to the city and the world in a manner that was deserving of its greatness. The solution would be one of the most ambitious engineering feats in history. Cassatt was determined to find a better way than ferry boats to shuttle 72 million people across the Hudson. Building a bridge or a tunnel was no easy task. The river at the point of the Pennsylvania ferry crossings was close to a mile wide and 65 feet deep with strong tides. No engineering project to date had confronted such a challenge. Cassatt began by putting in charge his assistant, Samuel Ray. Like Cassatt, Ray had worked his way up at the Pennsylvania as a civil engineer. When he was named to be assistant to the president, his first task had been to study alternatives to crossing the Hudson. Ray was the perfect choice to head up the New York project. Different plans for bridging the river were explored, all tremendously ambitious. One called for a massive cantilevered bridge with a main span of 2,300 feet carrying six railroad tracks. Another would have featured a span twice as long as the Brooklyn Bridge, supported by 500-foot towers. But each of these plans fell away 
either the railroad withdrew because of the enormous potential cost, or the federal government opposed the bridges as a hindrance to navigation on the river. With bridges no longer an option, Ray and Cassatt turned their attention to a tunnel. Uh, tunneling underwater had been done uh, in England as early as the first half of the 19th century, but nothing had been done on the scale that was required to tunnel under the Hudson until very late in the 19th century. Uh, there were several things that, that had to be developed. One was the ability to work under pressure, uh, which was required to, to tunnel below water like that. And even if a tunnel could be built, there was the problem of pulling trains through it. With such a long tunnel, steam locomotives would asphyxiate the passengers before they got to the other side. But Ray thought he'd found the answer, electricity. Electric traction had been developed in the 1880s, and in the mid-1890s, it was used successfully in a railroad tunnel in Baltimore. But in 1901, electric traction was used to bring trains through a tunnel along the Seine to an underground station at the new Quai d'Orsay station in Paris. Cassatt was traveling in Europe at the time, and Ray cabled his boss to stop in Paris and have a look at this new electrified tunnel. Cassatt went to Paris and came away impressed. Also in 1901, the Pennsylvania took advantage of an opportunity and acquired control of the Long Island Railroad. This new line would allow the railroad to carry passengers to the tip of fast-growing Long Island. Now it also had to cross the river on the east side of Manhattan. With belief in electric traction technology and the financial incentive of the Long Island Railroad, Cassatt announced the Pennsylvania Railroad would do what had never been done. They would build tunnels under not just one, but two rivers. The elements of, of Cassatt's plan were, first of all, the tunnels under the Hudson River, which got them to Manhattan, tunnels under the East River, which provided a way to take the trains across to a new storage and servicing yard at Sunnyside in Queens, and also to bring the Long Island trains into Manhattan from Long Island. Uh, there was the New York Connecting Railroad through the Hellgate Bridge, which was to be built, connected them to the New Haven Railroad in, in Connecticut. And tying all of this together would be a magnificent new terminal in Manhattan, a terminal the likes of which the world had never seen. But first, the tunnels had to be built. Two tunnels would go under the Hudson and four under the East River. Each shaft would start from opposite sides of the rivers and meet at mid-channel. This was a, an enormous engineering undertaking for its time. These, these tunnels were, were longer and uh, larger than anything that had been done up to that time. Uh, it was a very difficult uh, river to tunnel under because of the, the conditions on the bottom. One of the problems that they faced was that the tunnel had to be drilled through nothing but soft material, clay and sand and silt on the bottom of the river. The Hudson tunnels would have to be drilled at 40 feet below the low tide level to avoid damage from heavy anchors or sunken vessels, and to ensure they could pass below existing piers. Each single track tunnel would be formed of a cast iron shell with an outside diameter of 23 feet. This shell would be made from a series of two foot wide rings bolted together. The cast iron shell would then be lined on the inside by two feet of concrete. Since the tunnels would be drilled not in rock, but in soft silt, Ray and his staff decided on a driven shield tunneling system. The shield, only slightly larger than the diameter of the tunnel, was hydraulically pushed through the muck. The 200-ton shield was all that stood between the workers and the river bottom. Seven doors in the shield allowed workers to scoop out the debris. Then a large hydraulic arm lifted a section of ring into place for bolting. In the beginning, it took five or six hours to install one ring which advanced the tunnel by two and a half feet. By the time the work was in full progress, a ring could be put up in 30 minutes. The other great challenge of the tunnel was pressure, 
In order to keep the river out of the tunnel, compressed air had to be forced into an airlock to build up pressure in the tunneling area. Workers coming out of this high pressure area too quickly faced the agony of caisson disease, later known as the bends. It, it was hard work uh, building these tunnels. Uh, it was hard working under the compressed air uh, pressure. Uh, it, was, it was damp. There was always some water leaking into the tunnel. Uh, there was a lot of danger involved that they had to be concerned about. Uh, on the uh, Hudson River tunnels, they had a few uh, what were called blowouts where the compressed air would find a weak spot in the material under the river and blow out through that up into the river. And uh, there was a great danger whenever that happened that uh, water could, could then enter the tunnel and, uh, and drown all the workers there. Uh, on the East River tunnels where they were very close to the bottom of the river, they had even more problems of that kind. Uh, there were a number of serious blowouts there and, and several fatalities from flooding of the tunnel. As best he could, Cassatt provided his workers with some comforts. Each man's locker was heated so he wouldn't have to put on cold, wet clothes each day. Hot baths were available, as well as a full-time doctor. And hot coffee was standing by around the clock. On September 12, 1906, less than two years after starting and six days ahead of schedule, the two ends of the first Hudson Tunnel finally met. They were less than one inch from perfect alignment, an incredible feat considering the fairly primitive surveying techniques that were used. But the other Hudson River Tunnel and the four East River Tunnels had to be completed. Concrete poured and road bed and track laid. It was not until June 21st, 1909 that Ray and his staff would make the first crossing through the tunnels, not by train, but in a shiny Lozier automobile. The first amazing step in Alexander Cassatt's master plan had been achieved. The rivers had been crossed. The Pennsylvania Railroad had reached Manhattan. Now Cassatt would create the ultimate train station, the grand gateway to New York that had eluded him for so long. Alexander Cassatt wanted a monumental gateway. You have to remember, he was so frustrated, he was so anxious to get his trains into Manhattan. I mean, for 30 years he'd been trying to get his trains into Manhattan. When he finally did, he wanted something that reflected the greatness of the railroad. He wanted it to be announced with fanfare and bugles. And what better way to say, I've arrived, than to have this extraordinary building. At the turn of the century, the people who ran corporations were different than the people who run corporations today. They had a different value system. It came from the fact that someone like uh, Cassatt would regard architecture as something that should have integrity, and he would, it would make sense to him to spend money on that. To design his great terminal, Cassatt chose Charles McKim, an architect he knew would share his respect for the traditional forms of classical architecture. Charles McKim was one-third of the noted architectural team of McKim, Mead, and White. Together, these men had produced some of the most notable buildings in Manhattan, including Madison Square Garden and the Lowe Library at Columbia University. McKim was a studious and contemplative architect with enormous respect for the structures of the past. While his more famous partner, Stanford White, worked from bravado and inspiration, McKim's trademarks were research and thoroughness, but he also had a great sense of the dramatic, which would soon reveal itself in his plans for Pennsylvania Station. Both of these qualities were best shown in the admiration he felt for the Baths of Caracalla in ancient Rome. McKim had always been thrilled with this immense structure's haunting use of light and space to enhance brilliant engineering. The Baths of Caracalla would now become Charles McKim's inspiration for Penn Station. For years, the railroad had quietly been buying up real estate on Manhattan's west side, just below 34th Street and a few blocks east of the Hudson River. 
It was not what anyone would call a choice piece of real estate. Its eastern edge was part of the old tenderloin district of bars and brothels. To the north, gangs of hoodlums wandered Hell's Kitchen. The western edge was a network of railroad tracks, slaughterhouses, and slums. In all, the Pennsylvania would acquire title to 28 acres, of which seven and a half acres would be used for the station itself. The station complex would truly match the Roman baths for awe-inspiring size. There would be 21 tracks and 11 platforms. Overall, the station and yard would contain 16 miles of track. But before any construction could begin, 500 buildings would be raised and more than 1,500 people would be displaced. Entire blocks of tenements, shops, factories, and even a church would all have to be eliminated. In all, 5 million bricks and 6,000 truckloads of rubble were carted away. Excavation started in the summer of 1904 and would continue for nearly five years. The hole had to be dug 58 feet down through Manhattan Rock and two city blocks wide on either side of 8th Avenue. The work of digging the foundation was extremely difficult. Sewers, water and gas mains had to be protected at all times. And 9th Avenue, with its elevated railroad, had to be supported by an elaborate system of support beams, trusses and posts. As Penn Station grew out of the hole, people at last grasped the scale of McKim's vision. The building's principal facade, which would run for 430 feet, or two city blocks along 7th Avenue, was to be a colonnade of 30 columns, four and a half feet wide and 35 feet high. The main entrance was 102 feet wide, with twin maidens representing night and day towering over the portico. The maidens would flank a clock with a seven-foot dial. Trains moving on the many miles of track, which would be part of the overall terminal system, would require so much electricity, the railroad had to build its own power station in Queens. McKim's design would be nearly three times the size of the St. Louis station, then the largest in the nation. New Yorkers had heard these statistics and seen sketches in the newspapers of what McKim and Cassatt had in mind. There was a growing sense of anticipation and excitement as the months passed, and the huge station grew out of the immense hole and raised its great presence over the old streets. On November 27, 1910, after more than seven years of construction, the station opened for service. More than 100,000 people got their first look at the new station that day. They were not disappointed. Charles McKim planned very carefully a sequence of spaces that went from large to small, from wide to narrow, and from level to level. When you entered the station, at the 7th Avenue side, there was a vestibule, and beyond that, a very wide arcade. It was meant to look like the arcades in Milan and Naples. So you walked past all of these shops, and then at the end of them, it was about two-thirds of a block long, there were places to eat. The beautiful main dining room had Corinthian pilasters, a coffered ceiling, and seating in fine walnut chairs for 500. Passing by the dining room, passengers then came to the head of the grand 40-foot stairway. The main waiting room that now opened before them was breathtaking. That room was considered the largest and most monumental single room in the world at that time. It had a vaulted ceiling that it, at its highest point really was 150 feet, which is the equivalent of 15 modern stories today. The uh, room was lit with natural light from very large half-round windows at the clerestory level that sent these wonderful shafts of sunlight into the station. The room just stood there waiting to receive you. Again, this extraordinary generosity of spirit. When you went in, it was all so intangible, but it was really there. Every single element in that station was designed to make you feel good about yourself. It would have been very hushed, restful, 
echoing. And the sheer size would have been overwhelming in the height of the ceiling so that it would have been beautiful, but it would have also been dwarfing. Although it was called the main waiting room, there was in fact not a single seat in this space larger than the nave of St. Peter's. The real waiting rooms were elsewhere. Men and women still waited in separate areas. The men's waiting room featured a boot black and a barber shop. A proper gentleman also found other services here. They used to have a changing room for him so that if he was going out to the theater that night, he could change into his tuxedo. There would be, there would be a, a little tray laid out for him with a whisk and combs and all sorts of things. It was very grand. It was marvelously grand. Uh, beyond the general waiting room in Pennsylvania Station was the concourse. McKim intended this very structural, straightforward kind of space to be a transition for the traveler between the Roman splendor of the general waiting room that they had just come from to the utilitarianism of the tracks and the viaducts and the train yards and everything that they were going toward. Picture a room made of glass and steel, a vaulted ceiling. Your mind took a journey long before you got on a train and when the train announcer announced, called out the stations, announced the trains that were departing, it was as evocative as a, as a, a train whistle in the night. It was an extraordinary room. Cassatt and McKim's creation was truly a product of a very special time in America. For travelers, a long journey was an extraordinary experience. People expected it to be heightened by a sense of luxury. However, we still wanted to be on the cutting edge of modern technology, which means that Pennsylvania Station didn't simply have stairways, it had elevators, it had ramps, it even had an escalator. It had conveyor belts for the mail, and of course the ultimate thing was it was this very large underground electrified station which had never been done before in this country. For all its beauty, Penn Station also had to function efficiently and that it did. For those who wished, carriageways on either side of the building would drop passengers at steps leading directly to the main waiting room which housed the ticket counters and baggage facilities. Baggage was delivered to and from trains by a special subway. In only seven years, the Pennsylvania Railroad had achieved the long-sought goal of delivering passengers to Manhattan. But it had achieved much more than that. The train-riding public now entered America's greatest city through a stunning edifice of steel and glass, of swirling light and glowing marble. A magnificent palace of railroading had been born where journeys began and ended with a sense of magic and fantasy. Sadly, Alexander Cassatt and Charles McKim never saw the gem they had created. Both died before their station was completed. They would not be a part of the 50 years of greatness which lay ahead. After its opening, Americans by the millions discovered there was nothing quite like Penn Station. Its great spaces, efficient layout, and inviting luxuries made the terminal more successful every year. People could now see the great organized vision of Cassatt's plan. The glamorous station received all the attention, but an important key to the station's success was the huge Sunnyside rail yards across the East River in Queens. Here, hundreds of trains each day were cleaned and restocked with food and supplies before heading back to the station to pick up departing passengers. The final part of his master plan was the construction of a bridge across Hell Gate, the narrow connection between Long Island Sound and the East River. This would at last connect the new station with New England railroads. The important thing here was, was it wasn't just the station, it wasn't just the tunnels, it wasn't the electrification, it was all of them put together to make up a whole. You had a whole system of, of railroad facilities that all had to work together to serve this important terminal in New York, and it worked wonderfully. By the 1920s, Penn Station had eclipsed its rival, Grand Central. It was handling 300 trains a day and 60 million passengers annually the busiest of all North American stations.
Gradually, Penn Station became one of New York City's important landmarks, and its trains were quickly part of every New York traveler's vocabulary. The Florida Special and Miamian took vacationers south. The Crescent Limited left daily for New Orleans, the St. Louisian for the Gateway City, and the Congressional Limited became the train on the New York-Washington run. But far and away, the greatest train operating out of Pennsylvania Station was the Broadway Limited. This star of the New York-Chicago run was an all-Pullman train of sleeping, dining, and lounge cars only. No expense was spared to offer passengers the ultimate in luxury and service. Fresh flowers and fine linen were everywhere. The best champagne was on ice. A barber and stenographer were available, as was a piano player in the lounge. Four chefs could prepare as many as 24 different dishes. Penn Station and the Broadway Limited were popular with celebrities like Charlie Chaplin. Sophie Tucker loved to sample new dishes in the dining car kitchen. Will Rogers, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, Franklin Roosevelt, and many more were all fans of this great train. The Broadway Limited was also famous for its races with its great crosstown rival, the New York Central's luxurious 20th Century Limited. Their competition was most dramatic on the return trip to New York. Both of the magnificent trains left Chicago daily at the same time. At Inglewood, Illinois, the two trains raced side by side for six miles, thrilling passengers and crew to their special competition. Throughout the 20s and 30s, the number of passengers using Penn Station increased enormously. A small army of people were employed at the station to take care of the tens of thousands of passengers who moved through the station daily. Nearly 3,000 people worked at Penn Station. 335 red caps assisted passengers with bags. 76 clerks sold tickets. 20 operators answered the 700 phone calls which came in every hour. 400 cooks, waiters and waitresses served an estimated 5,000 meals every day. A police force of 32 officers patrolled the station. And during the Christmas season, an organist serenaded passengers in the main waiting room with carols. Pennsylvania Station's finest hours came during World War II. At all hours, soldiers and sailors moved through the station, often entire units packed into the concourse or waiting room to board special trains. At night, servicemen could be found sleeping on waiting room benches or even on the steps of the Grand Stairway. The years of World War II provided the ultimate test for Charles McKim's design. The architect had been gone for 40 years, but his vision for the efficient movement of great numbers was never more successful. Day after day, year after year, ever-increasing numbers of passengers poured into the station to board a round-the-clock stream of trains. The peak year for the station was 1945, when a record 109 million passengers swarmed through the station. During that year, 350,000 people passed through every day to board 900 different trains. Once the war ended, the Pennsylvania Railroad thought the post-war years would continue the railroad's success. But forces of fundamental change in America had begun. Forces which would profoundly affect Penn Station. The GIs who arrived home were in many cases not the same young men who had gone off to war. After stressful years of depression and the war, American values were about to undergo great change which would have enormous effect on Penn Station and the nation's railroads. After World War II, men were coming back from the war with a keen sense of the future. I think that most of them felt that they didn't want to go back to the past. I think that they felt that the past had betrayed them.
A gritty city was not the place they wanted to live. A new American dream had arrived, a house in the suburbs and a car. Real estate developers provided the houses by the thousands. And Detroit poured forth an endless stream of shiny new cars. And in 1946, the federal government started what would become the interstate highway system, the biggest construction project in its history. Americans took to the roads in numbers that could not have been imagined before the war. And for millions of GIs who had spent so much time in planes during the war, commercial airlines now offered a tempting, faster alternative to long-distance rail travel. Ridership of American railroads fell dramatically. Although it would take 20 years to complete, the decline of the Pennsylvania Railroad and its terminal was actually very rapid. By the 1950s, the Pensy's ridership was down to a quarter of its wartime peak, and the railroad was $72 million in debt. Each year, there were fewer passengers. As the railroad's financial condition deteriorated, the staff at Penn Station was cut and upkeep was neglected. When Penn Station was built, it's 1910, uh, the exterior was this pristine pink uh, Milford granite, an exquisite looking material. By the 1960s, it looked so laden, it looked dark, and that wonderful Roman quality actually became a negative once the station was no longer kept up because it looked intimidating. It looked like a huge, dark tomb. Pennsylvania Station was never what you would call a moneymaker for the, for the Pennsylvania Railroad. And from about 1950, the Pennsylvania was looking for some way of using the very valuable air rights over the station to create something that would bring some income to the railroad. After several proposals for developing the space over Penn Station, one was finally selected by the railroad. In 1961, a press release announced that a new Madison Square Garden sports complex would be built above the tracks. Buried in the announcement was the news that many had feared. One of the greatest buildings in the history of American architecture would be torn down. And you have to keep in mind, there was no landmarks preservation law to protect the building. There was no law on the city books. There was no law anywhere to say, you can't take this building. So in, in effect, even though Pennsylvania Station belonged to the country, it belonged to each and every one of us, it was also the property of the Pennsylvania Railroad. And the Pennsylvania Railroad could do whatever they wanted, and they did. And they destroyed it. Little by little, the old Penn Station gradually came down. McKim's magnificent sun-splashed waiting room, the magical lacework of the concourse roof. Each section gradually yielded to the wrecker's ball. By 1966, it was all gone. In its place is a low-ceilinged subterranean station with an office building and Madison Square Garden smashed down upon it. The original tracks and platforms all remain. The tunnel system still works as efficiently as ever. And trains bound for New England still cross the great Hellgate Bridge. But McKim's magnificent generosity of space and light was replaced by a cramped, fluorescent-lit warren of practicality and cost-effectiveness. Cassatt's Grand Gateway now welcomes passengers with trinket stands and advertising. After Pennsylvania Station was demolished, it dawned on people what had happened, not so much just because of the absence of this wonderful building, but because of what they found in its place. The new Penn Station was a shock. It's really just a basement with a bunch of escalators. It's about as alienating and boring as a parking garage. All that remains today at the site of the old station are two of the 20 proud eagles which once guarded the entrances. Night and day, 
the magnificent maidens who once marked time's passage, now sit grime-covered and forgotten in a park in New Jersey. It wasn't until the station was torn down, people turned around and realized it was much more than a building that was destroyed. We had been deprived of our past. We'd been robbed of our heritage. We became instant orphans. Millions of people come through Penn Station every day, and unless they look at some of the pictures of the old station that you can see here, they have no idea of what was taken from them. Penn Station has been gone for over 30 years, but recently a plan has been created to build a new Penn Station using this building, the James Farley Post Office building, across the street from the old station. It was built by Penn Station's architects directly over the tracks to handle mail. If finally approved, the classic Beaux-Arts building would be renovated to create a magnificent new entrance to the station, inspired by the old one. In addition to expanded platforms and other Amtrak facilities, the new station will include 275,000 square feet of shops, stores, theaters, and restaurants. This magnificent building, as solid, as timeless as it seems, would surprise many people if they realize it was built over operating station platforms. Trains are going underneath us right now. People are coming off those trains, getting on those trains um, in the crowded, most crowded, busiest station in the nation. And our hope is that we'll be able to take people off those platforms, which are now desperately overcrowded, and move them upwards into this great building. The purpose of the plan to redevelop Penn Station is to create a gateway once again in this city, a gateway that transports more people than any other place in America. Uh, it is also, uh, it will be the center piece of the multi-billion dollar high rail system that will, will eventually be built in the Northeast Corridor. Right now when someone comes into New York, they come into that. What we hope is that when someone comes into New York, they'll come into this. This is the most magnificent facade possibly in America. If we can rebuild Penn Station in the Farley Building, New York will have this as its front door. Senator Daniel Moynihan remembers the old Penn Station and looks forward to the new one. When I was a lad, I was in the Navy, and our ship would uh, uh, come into port at Norfolk, and you'd get on a train for a weekend's leave, and you'd arrive uh, with all the hopes of youth and possibilities uh, in this wonderful space that welcomed you and said you are home, and you're going to have a wonderful time. When you came up the steps into the great nave, oh, you knew you had arrived in the most important city in the world. Uh, no question about that. It is a remarkable serendipity that we shall have a second chance to recreate uh, Pennsylvania Station. It was an act of vandalism to destroy this station, and it is an act of, of confidence and understanding to recreate it. Thomas Wolfe perhaps best described Pennsylvania Station in his book, You Can't Go Home Again. For here, as nowhere else on earth, men were brought together for a moment at the beginning of time or end of their innumerable journeys. Here one saw their greetings and farewells. Here, in a single instant, one got the entire picture of the human destiny. Men came and went, they passed and vanished, and all were moving through the moments of their lives to death. All made small tickings in the sound of time, but the voice of time remained aloof and unperturbed, a drowsy and eternal murmur below the immense and distant roof. Pennsylvania Station, Alexander Cassatt's great palace of railroading, sadly lasted for only 50 years. But its legacy to us all is a heightened awareness of America's important buildings and their meaning to our cultural heritage. It's a great gift from a great building.